When I have access to a gym, I very seldom do deliberate cardio, like steady state exercise, but I'll, you know, I'll kind of like shorten up the sets or the, uh, the rest time in between sets when mm -hmm. I'm, you know, when I'm lifting yeah, so that I keep my heart rate up. I mean, I'm not like, you know, I, I, I can't really estimate what my heart rate is. It's probably around 120, like the whole time that right. I'm like the, that I'm doing that resistance training. Would you say that that's sufficient to get that aerobic component? Yeah. So there's a lot of talk in the literature about things like cardiorespiratory fitness levels, VO2 max, um, you know, working at a certain capacity of your heart rate reserve or HRR 60 to 80% for optimal BDNF release. In the real world, that's kind of hard to keep track of. Most people aren't going to do that. And I, I think when people don't understand how people work, <laughs> and so they, they tend to make those recommendations like, oh, yes, you want to exercise at 80% of your VO2 max. And people are like, I don't know that. <laughs> and like, where do you get that done? Right. That's really challenging. I'm not saying it's not helpful. And there's, you know, age predicted heart rate reserve, you know, 220 minus your age times 0.6 or 0.8 to get that 80%, 60 to 80%. But and also people working out with heart rate monitors and like, what, what heart rate should I be at? And I, I see a lot of anxiety around that. What I find more practical and simplistic is the rate of perceived exertion, not the Borg scale where it's like eight to 16, some weird arbitrary numbers, but mm. just one to 10, very simple. One being the easiest, 10 being the hardest. If you look at a six, that's 60% yeah. of your max. Eight is 80% of your max. Um, and so I would say that you want to average around six to eight out of 10. And that's your rate of perceived exertion. RPE. Your RPE. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And so if you were trying to get in your aerobic exercise and your resistance training, you want about six to eight. Now, when we look at rate of perceived exertion, it could be looked at from a cardiovascular perspective, meaning how hard is your fat or how fast is your heart pumping? But you could also look at it from a neuromuscular perspective. How hard are your muscles working? Right. And you could also look at it from a cognitive perspective, how mentally demanding is it? 10 being the most, one being the least. So I like to take that RPE scale and apply it to different things, especially when we're looking at that skillful modality, that neuromotor category. We say, well, how mentally demanding was that exercise routine on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the most, one being the least, right? So we could apply it to, we could have a cardiovascular RPE, we could have a neuromuscular RPE, and we could have a cognitive RPE, if you will. And they're useful for each of those respective categories, the cardiovascular RPE for the aerobic category, the uh, neuromuscular RPE for the resistance category, and the uh, cognitive RPE for the skillful category. And you could look at it per exercise, per technique, per workout, per week on average. Am I, you know, six out of 10 down the line, that type of thing, where it doesn't apply well as mind-body exercise. Because hmm. if we looked at higher intensities all the time. We're looking at a lot of autonomic nervous system upregulation, fight and flight. I think we would agree that the world needs some <laughs> parasympathetic, right? I think most of us do. And so with the, the mind-body exercises, you know, of course, there's forms of Pilates and yoga uh, that are very cognitively, uh, or not just cognitively, but uh, physically and metabolically demanding. Um, but I'm mostly talking about the more restorative ones, and RPE would not necessarily apply there. But you could say, uh, sort of this like relaxation RPE on a scale of one to 10, how relaxed are you during or after 10 being the most relaxed? So there's a lot of ways to use RPE. And those would count as skill-based training? I would say so. You know, it, it's sort of contradictory to what I'm saying because in the examples of the exercise programs we gave, we didn't really mention mind-body exercise, Yeah. but it's helpful to throw that in there one or two times a week as well. I know it's challenging because if you're looking at these, well, that's actually four things that I need one to three times a week. I don't have that much time. Well, maybe there's a, yeah, maybe there's a fourth category, right? Like active right. recovery. Right. Or, that's, yeah. that's a really good point. So uh, that could also be a part of it. I think that foam rolling and breath work and yoga and restorative postures are all a part of exercise programs now. I think it's helpful to throw those in. So a great way, I think, to solve this problem is to have these multi-component exercise sessions Let's say, you know, I, I say perfect with major air quotes because there has, there's actually some downsides to this and I'll explain why. But if we had 20 minutes of aerobic, 20 minutes of resistance and 20 minutes of skill and maybe some warm up cool down that address the mind body or restorative stuff, that would be great, right? The challenge with that is a dose response question, right? Well, 
is 60 minutes of aerobic exercise going to give me a better dosage of the specific brain health benefits of that modality if I just do 20 minutes in one session? I don't know. Hmm. But I would lean towards the multimodal a little bit. So. Yeah. 